Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar today. My name is Damien Robbins, and I'm an account manager here at AMS. I'm also joined by Richard Spinks, who is our technical manager. So I'm going to start off with a brief introduction to who we are and why we developed the subject access request portal for the NHS. And then we'll get on with the demonstration of the software itself. Now, if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the questions window on the right hand side of your screens and we'll try to answer these at the end of the session. So first, a quick introduction to AMS and the reasons why we, we developed the portal. Now, we've been working with the NHS for over 25 years, providing and supporting software solutions for secure messaging. The journey to developing the subject access request portal was really a follow on from our file transfer software. Now, we initially created file transfer uh, to enable companies to send and receive large files and confidential information easily and securely. And then kind of what happened is our existing customer base of NHS trusts started showing an interest in using the solution as well. Now, as of today, we have over 25 NHS trusts using the file transfer platform, and many of you have joined us for the webinar today, so thank you for that. Now, some use cases for file transfer. The main purpose of file transfer is for sharing patient notes and images with patients and authorised third parties, mostly in relation to subject access requests. We now have quite a few different departments using the file transfer platform, and here are just some examples of those. As you can see, the software can be used by pretty much anybody that needs the ability to share files securely and with confidence. However, with file transfer, there was a key part of the process that was missing, which was how to manage the request part of the process. Now, the trust we spoke to were using a variety of solutions, such as Datix, uh, Ulysses and Excel spreadsheets in order to log and track the requests. So this was in order to ensure responses were made on time and to get an overview of the current workflow to prioritize tasks. The problem was that nothing really seemed to be focused enough to provide trusts with exactly what they wanted. And so based on requests and suggestions from our existing NHS customers and contacts, we've tried to create a solution which will help solve this problem for everybody. So this next slide shows some of the most common challenges that our customers in the NHS tell us about. Many of the current processes are very time consuming with actions recorded manually. And it's often the case that each department manages their own requests, which means there are separate processes, each managed slightly differently. This can make it difficult to get an overview of everything that's being worked on, what's outstanding, what's already been processed, and what's overdue. With the drive for digital transformation, the current processes are often reliant on physical documents and media, which makes it difficult to move to more electronic and centralized process. And finally, most of the people we've spoken to have to spend a fair amount of time manually collating reports and performance metrics and they were looking for an easier way to manage this. Okay, so that's some of the challenges. Now I'm going to hand you over to Richard for a live demo of the solution. Now bear with me, please, while I just make Rich the presenter so he can take over. Great, so, so hopefully, Rich, you now have control, is that right? Yeah, I think so, thanks Damien. So Brilliant. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, you can see my screen okay, I hope. So to demonstrate this application, I'm going to use two web browsers. Uh, the first web browser you see at the moment are Google Chrome. I'll set up the login page of the application. And I'm going to use this web browser to demonstrate the application uh, as if I was someone who manages the subject access request. And I'll probably call this person the request handler. The second web browser I have open um, is set up the landing page or the home page of the application. Um, and I'm going to use this web browser to demonstrate the application as if I was someone who's actually making a subject access request. And you can see I've also got a, an email account open here, just a sort of demo email account, just so we can see 
the email notifications that are generated when somebody makes a subject access request and as the request gets uh, managed or processed. But let me start off uh, as the request handler. And the first thing I'm going to do is log in. And you'll see once I've logged in, the first page that I'm taken to is this dashboard view. And this gives us, the request handler, a really nice overview of the active requests in the system. So I can see my requests. Um, so these are the requests that I'm working on that have been uh, assigned to me. I can see the pull requests. And this is where the requests go uh, once they've been submitted. Um, so nobody's working on these requests at the moment. Nobody's uh, been assigned to them. And then I can see all the active requests across the whole system. I can see an overview of that as well. You'll notice from the graphs we have uh, different colors to indicate the status of a request. Um, when a request first comes in, as I said, it goes into this request pool and it's going to have a category of uncategorized, or sorry, a label of uncategorized. And it's one of the tasks of the request handler to give that request a category. By default, we set you up with one request category. I think it's called default. And um, it breaches after 30 days. I think it turns red after 21 days and it will turn a request amber after 14 days and obviously it'd be green um, before that. But you're not limited to the number of that, that request category. Obviously, as an administrator, you can create as many request categories as you like. And that just helps you prioritize and manage the requests that have different thresholds in terms of when they breach um, and when you want to show them as red and you know, prioritize them at a higher level. Um, and this color scheme goes throughout, it's not just on this dashboard, it goes throughout the whole web Web requesters, uh, sorry, request handlers view. So all the lists will, will have these sort of color schemes to, to help you see instantly where a request is in terms of its status. And even if you treat all requests in the same way, so perhaps you all requests breach after 30 days or 60 days, um, and perhaps you want to have them all flag up as red after 21 days, whatever it might be, it's still sometimes worth having multiple request categories because they're really useful when we run our reports. They're, they can be used as a metric to um, isolate certain requests, which you'll um, see later on when I get to the admin area. But let's have a look at what uh, other areas a request handler has. Um, we've got the upload request option, and this allows us to manually upload requests. So hopefully most requests will come in online, but no doubt you'll still receive some requests via email, um, maybe through the post or, or over the phone. And this allows us to add those requests into the application. And obviously the benefit of having them all in one application is they can be managed and processed in one place, but we can also report across all of the trust requests rather than just a subset of the ones that have come in online. So the first thing we would do is we would choose what type of request we want to onboard and then we would just fill in the necessary details and then probably attach the rest of the request um, as a file to that um, request. The nice thing about this manual form upload, just like the public forms that um, you'll see in a minute when somebody makes a request, is they're completely customizable by the administrator. So this gives the administrator the opportunity to make these as slim as possible, so uh, as short as possible, to so really help you onboard the request as quickly as you can. Because remember, you can still attach the information that's been given to you to make that request as a file. Next, I'll flip to my request. So this is a list of requests that I'm dealing with, that I'm working on. You can see that we can uh, view when the request was added or submitted. We can see the patient name that the request refers to. Um, we can see the form that the requester filled in. We can see the unique reference number that's been given um, to the requester. And if it's been categorized, we can see that category label. On the right-hand side, we've got some icons, and this just helps us identify the status of the request. So we can see, unfortunately, this request has breached. This request has 13 days until it breaches. This request has 26 days. Um, see, obviously, it's assigned to me because it's in my request queue. And uh, this request has got the clock stopped, which means I'm probably waiting for a bit of information before I can proceed with that request. The pull requests, this is where requests go 
before they've been assigned. So as soon as somebody submits a request online, it's going to appear in here, and it's up to us as the request handler to triage that request, to either assign it to ourselves to work on or to assign it to a colleague. And then we have our all request view, which shows all the requests in the system. So this doesn't just show active requests. This is our historic view of all the requests that we've dealt with. It shows completed requests, uh, any rejected requests, um, this view is optional, so an administrator can turn this on or off for you. Um, so if you don't see this, it just means that the administrator hasn't given you access to it. I should probably mention as well, just uh, this table is no different to any of the others. Um, throughout the application, you can sort of page through the records. Obviously, you can search for records, so it should be quite easy to search and find records based on uh, the reference ID or the patient's name, for example. Um, if you need to export the data that's in a table, you can. Um, so we would just go down to our paging options if we wanted everything. Um, hit the last paging option. So at the moment this is showing 50 just because there's only 31 total, but if there were thousands in here, it would just say all at the bottom. But we would just select our last option, and then we can download that table in different formats, so in a spreadsheet format, or we can download it in something like XML or JSON if we wanted to perhaps insert push it into another third party system or something like that. You can also choose what um, columns you want. So if the information isn't showing in there, you can, um, you can edit this from the column list. While I'm in here, I'll just show you the profile page for the request handler. Um, this allows us to enable or disable uh, an email notification uh, every time a request is assigned to us. We can change our password. So the password would have to meet the password complexity that our administrators set. And we can enable two-factor authentication. So it just helps secure our login with uh, an SMS code um, every time we, we uh, authenticate to the application. But now let's switch to our requester and make a, a subject access request. So I said before, the page you're viewing now, this is the landing page or the home page of the application. And this is the idea behind this page is it gives the person making the request all the information they need before they start. And because of that, the content is, again, completely customizable by the administrator. So the text you're seeing here is just some uh, dummy text that I put in. But as an administrator, you can um, change the headers, change the content, change the links. Um, you can add in pictures. You can add in hyperlinks, you can add in videos, um, whatever you need to put in there to give all the information you need to the person making the request, you can do so. And uh, if we've got time, I'll quickly show you that in the admin area as well, just how easy it is to do. Um, there's also application branding. So we can obviously put up our logo up here, our NHS logo if we wanted to. We can edit our trust name. We can put in a different hyperlink and there's some footer options as well that we can change. So it will give us a look and feel of our trust. Um, branding. But once the person who's making the request has read through this information and they're ready to get started, they can either log in if they've already got an account, or if they don't have an account, they can register. The registration process is really easy. They just type in their email address, hit register now, they'll receive an email, they click on a link within that email, which validates the ownership of that account at that time. They then choose a password and they're good to go. If the person making the request really doesn't want to make an account, they can continue as a guest. They can still submit the form online. As a request handler, you can still pick up that request in the request pool and manage it um, and handle it in pretty much the same way. But you do lose a bit of key functionality, um, which is why we want people to, make, uh, to sign up and have that account. If people have an account, it means that you can send them the files that they've requested online. So instead of putting them in the post, um, burning them to media, you'll be able to upload the files through the portal and the requester will be able to download them in a, in a secure way. You'll also be able to communicate to them in, in a secure way. So if you've got questions that you need to ask or if you want to send them some messages, you'll be able to do that if they have an account all through, uh, all through the secure portal. But I already have an account, so I'm going to skip this registration process and I'll sign in. And 
The page that they're taken to when a request is signed in is pretty simple. I can uh, create a new request. I can manage any existing requests that I have and I can change my profile settings. If I go to my profile settings, you can see it's very similar to request handler. I can change my password if I want to and I can also enable two-factor authentication on my login, which is quite nice. In regards to managing requests, uh, if I've only got one request and I click on that, it's going to take me straight into my quest and I can see the details of that request. If I'm a patient that makes multiple requests or I'm somebody that continually makes requests, maybe I'm a police officer or solicitor, then I'll be taken to this table view and I'll be able to manage all the requests that I've made um, in the system. And I can see if there's activity within a request. This one, for example, has a question that I need to answer. If there was a, an envelope there, it might mean that there's a numbered message or something like that. But um, we'll see how that works as I, as I go through the system. Um, but let me start create, to create a new request. And the first thing I need to do is choose what kind of request I'm going to make. The three requests that you see here, application for your own health records, application for requesting on behalf of others, and application for deceased health records, are just forms that we set you up with. Um, you don't have to keep these forms, so you can bin them if you don't like them, um, or you can use them as templates and maybe just edit the questions and change the layout. Or if you want to start fresh, um, you can add your own forms. Um, there's a form designer in the admin area, which I'll show you, which makes it really easy, which is kind of like a drag and drop interface, so you can create the forms and get the answers you need to handle uh, the subject access requests. So please don't take too much from these forms, they are just examples. But I'm going to make a request for my application for my own health records. And you'll see that there's four steps. And the first step is it's asking information about myself. So I'll go ahead and fill this form in. I'll put in my dummy email address here. Contact number, patient name, which I'm not sure what it is, but I know it's a 10 digit number. My date of birth, um, and I'll put in my home address as my browser's saved. You'll notice that some requests are required, and obviously, some um, questions need to be in a certain format, like the email address. If somebody's got this wrong, obviously, it will it'll prompt them, and they won't be able to go to the next page until they fix that error, as you kind of expect, I guess. Let's fix those mistakes. And get to the next section. Uh, now it's asking me to state the documentation I require, so I'll keep it really simple. Um, good. Patient notes on my appointment with Dr. Gray. And let's get to the next stage. And now I have to upload some documentation to uh, prove my identity. So I'll upload a driving license. This is just an example driving license I have. And then next I need to upload a document that confirms my address. So I'll choose a utility bill. And this upload works really well if the person's making the request is on, a, on their phone or on a tablet. Obviously, they can use their camera, so they can just take a picture of this documentation rather than having to scan it and browse to it or drag a drop to it uh, if you're on their laptop. But um, I'm happy with that, so I hit next. And then lastly, I just have to agree to these uh, declarations. And that's it. My request is now submitted. I'm taken to a confirmation page. And this confirmation page, like a lot of the other things, We've talked about is completely configurable by an administrator on a per form basis. So the text you see in here can be amended. You can even pull in some of the fields that have been filled in from the form. So for example, if I wanted to put the person's name um, that is filled in the form that I captured, I could, I could do that. Um, but probably what you definitely want to include is this unique reference number. Um, and the unique reference number, the, the, the format that I've got here, or demo and uh, ROR at the end, and even the, um, the unique number in the middle is all customizable, um, which I'll show you again in the admin area. So uh, you've got a few options about how we build that reference number.
but let me hit finish. And because I've got an account, I'm taken back to my portal. And if I click on manage requests, I'll be able to see my new request there at the top. Um, and obviously if I drill into it, I can see some of the details. So there's not a huge amount going on here, but um, we can see what I've requested when it was submitted and my reference number and things like that. Also, as the person who's made the request, I should have got uh, an email. Um, again, just a confirmation that the request has been received and uh, a reminder of my unique reference number. And this email content, again, can be configured by an administrator. So you can um, make sure that you're giving the person the right content uh, who's made a request. But let's now flick back to my request handler. And we'll pick up this request in the pull request. You can see our request in there from Ben Smith. And if we click on it, we're taken to the request details. At the very top, there's this call out text. And if there's anything that needs to be done within a request, it, it, it highlights it at the top here. And it's obviously prompting me to assign the request to either myself or to somebody else. But before I do that, I'll just scroll down and see some of the, the details of the request. Um, again, we can see the request reference number here at the top. We've got the status as active. We can see the person's name who's made the request, the name of the form that they filled. Uh, at this point, I can categorize the request. Um, I could change the status if I wanted to. And then we've got some information about when the request was submitted. And um, at the moment, we don't have a breach date just because we haven't categorized the request. If I scroll down a bit further, I can see some information from, from the form, so the patient details. Um, obviously, the patient name and the requester name might be different depending on what form has been completed. If it was a, an application for deceased health records, for example, um, they'd obviously be different. Um, I can also see what's been requested here at the bottom, and I can see uh, a little bit of uh, the state of the request in terms of how long it's been active for. If I want to see every question and answer was on the form, then I just click on forms, and I can view that information here. If I want to view the files that were uploaded with the request, I can go to my files area, and you can see the two files that um, were attached. I can upload files in here as well, so if I need to send somebody files, I can use this browse to files, or I can drag and drop files onto this area. Um, whether that's for me to send to the request, or whether that's for my own internal use, um, I can use this as the the file section for my request. I can view files online, um, obviously, or I can download them if I want to. The nice thing about being able to view them online is um, if you are working from a device that doesn't have the application to view the, view the file, um, you can still view it. And then I have my questions. So if I need to ask a question to the person that's made a request, Perhaps to expand on something they've answered in the form, I can do that here, which I'll come back to. And then I have the order of the request. So not too much in here at the moment, but you'll see as we handle that request, uh, this will get populated with pretty much everything that we do. So let's start off and um, categorize this request. Now I've seen the details, and I'm just going to say that this request is from a patient. Now I've categorized it, I've got a breach date, so I know um, when that request needs to be responded by. And the next thing I'm going to do is assign it. So I'll just assign it to myself. And you'll see the call out text has now changed, so it's asked me to do something else. But just before we get to that, um, just to let you know, the request obviously would now have moved from my pull request, be no longer here. It's gonna be sat in my request. But the next thing it's asking me to do for this request is to confirm the identity. And this is an optional setting that can be put on per form by the administrators. Um, the idea behind it is it will stop me sending any information to the person who's made the request before someone says, yes, this is the right person, before someone's confirmed the identity. To confirm the identity is quite easy. There's not too much logic behind it. We just click on the link, and if we're happy that the identity is being uh, confirmed. We just type in yes and hit go. At the moment, we do have this call out area again, a slight warning, just saying that the request has no files that confirms as identity documents. So if we want to do this, we can browse back to our file section, edit one of our files. We've already looked at the driver license, so we'll use this one. 
We still get a small preview up here, but if we're happy with the file, we can mark it as an identity doc. We've also got the ability to change the name, which is quite useful because if somebody has uploaded the file um, from their phone, sometimes it gets a really strange file name. So we can, uh, we can change that so it's a bit more logical for people viewing the request. So I'm happy with that. Um, you can instantly see that's now an identity document because the extra icon's there on this details column. If the scenario that somebody had uploaded something and it wasn't quite right, maybe we looked at this utility bill and the address was wrong, or perhaps it was too old, or there was something wrong with it that wasn't valid. Um, we could ask our requester to upload another file. So we can mark this, we could add a comment to this file, and say, let's just say this utility bill is not addressed to uh, Ben. Don't have to do this, but just so we've got a record of what's going on. And then we'll go to questions. We'll ask Ben just to upload us another utility bill. Um, could please send us another utility bill? Previous utility bill was not addressed to you. And we don't have to allow them to send us files. In this case, obviously, we, we do. Um, in many cases, we might just be asking them to maybe expand on, uh, on a question or maybe give a small detail of what the information they actually require. Um, in this case, we want them to send us one file. And we'll just hit Ask Now. And at this point, we could stop the clock. Um, some people, some trusts we know do stop the clock if they're requesting information. Some don't. Uh, again, this is optional, administrator can turn this on or off, but um, I'll stop the clock, so, and this basically means that from this point, our clock stopped. So the countdown to the breach um, has stopped until Ben's provided us with another utility bill. So let's flick back to our person who made the request, Ben, ben. and if we go to his inbox, He'll have another email just to alert him that he needs to take some action. So a question is you question may require your attention. Please log in and answer the question. So we'll hit log in. I'm already logged in, I imagine, still. So, yep, it's going to take me straight to my request. And you'll see there's a bit of a call-out area here to say there's some uh, question below that you need to answer. And here it is. So could you please send us another utility bill? I can view the question. I can upload another utility bill, I can add an optional comment if I want, um, sorry about that, here is one that is addressed to me, and Ben's answered the question, so it disappears from his view, he no longer needs to take any action on it, and if we switch back to our request handler, obviously his request handler, they'll get an email notification to say um, Ben's answered that question. If I click on questions, I can also see that it's answered. If I click on the question, um, I can see the whole question. I can see Ben's answer. If there are files attached to that answer, I can download them here if I wanted to, um, but they also will be in the file section. So at this point, if we were happy with Ben's new utility bill, we could mark that as an identity doc. Now we have our two forms of identification, so I'm happy that I can confirm the identity. That cooler area has changed now. It just shows me the names of the files that uh, identified as identity docs, and then we can hit yes, and we confirm. And now that allows me to uh, send Ben information uh, and complete the request. Again, that is just an optional step, so if that doesn't suit your workflow, you don't have to have that in there. Um, an administrator can just turn that on or off uh, with a checkbox. So now we've confirmed Ben's identity, um, we could go ahead and process this request. We might want to make some notes. So perhaps Ben gave us a call. Whatever it might be. Um, you can create as many notes as you like. You can search the content of those notes to find a specific one. You can just have one long running note if you prefer. 
whatever it might be. Um, but there's a notes area there just to sort of keep track of everything that's going on. But let's take it now that we've got the patient notes that uh, Ben requested. So we'll upload them to his request. I'll go in in a second. There we go. And we can now send them on to them. So we'll create a new response. Um, we've got different types of responses. Um, some that change the status of the request, some that don't. So in this case, we could just send them a message and, and provide them some files. We could send them a partial response, which is kind of indicating we're sending them some of the files that they've requested, but perhaps not everything. Uh, we could complete the response. So this is us saying, yep, yeah, here's everything you've asked for, or obviously we could reject the response. So we'll uh, complete our response. And we can type in the message content um, a little note from Therese. So here are your patient notes. Um, can't seem to spell patient today, sorry. Uh, we also have templates. So if our administrator adds um, templates in, then it will pre-populate this message content. So it just saves us writing in the same information over and over again. Uh, we need to remember to attach our patient notes. So we'll choose them from our list of files. And now I'm happy that I can hit send. And I can probably should have started the clock back up. So let me start the clock back up. And then I can complete my request. I can add in some notes here. They're optional. They just go with the order of the request. So now the request is completed. And if we look in our audit, obviously the request status is now completed. It's removed from my request. It will now be sat in the all requests. I can view the audit just to show you how that's built up. So it's kind of logged every single action that's happened. And obviously the last action in there is our request has been completed. If we flick over to uh, Ben, who made the request, he will receive Another email notification to say the request has been completed. And again, he can log in. But if I just refresh this view, you can see the status has changed. Um, it says the request is completed. There's a message down there. And if we browse down, we can see this unread message with attachments. If I click on it, I can then download all of the files that are attached to that response. If there are lots of files, um, which in many cases I'm sure there would be, and we can download all the files in one go, just as a zip. And then once that zip's downloaded, you'll see it will contain the files that have been sent to us. So hopefully quite easy for Ben to make the request and quite easy for him to receive the details or the documentation that you sent him. Hopefully it's quite easy for you to manage that request in the portal. It doesn't really get much more complicated than that. But I did want to show you some of the admin area, um, just so you can see some of the core functionality uh, of the application. So if your account, when you log on, has got the admin access, you'll see the cogs here up on the right-hand side, and it just takes you to the admin area. Within here, we've got um, some settings you probably won't change and some settings that you probably will change. The storage settings is where we store the files. Um, all of the files that are uploaded or handled in the portal are in UK data regions in Microsoft Azure's platform. But if you did want to uh, change uh, where they're stored, you can. Um, we handle the email notifications that the platform sends. Um, we're really good at sending the email notifications into people's inboxes so they don't get picked up as spam or junk, which uh, a lot of other transactional email unfortunately does on other platforms. But if you did want to send that email through your own trust um, mail environment, um, we can set that up here if needs be. The security settings, this is where an admin can change things such as what happens when somebody enters their password incorrectly X amount of times, the complexity a password needs to be. We can also restrict um, via IP address where you can access the client and the admin area from, so not the sort of public view, but uh, the request handler's view in the admin area. 
um, just to help secure the application. And obviously, as you've seen before, we've also got the two-factor authentication you can turn on. We've got our request categories. So we start you off with just the default one. Obviously, you can delete it if you don't like it, but this is where an administrator would come in and add in the different request categories that can be used to help prioritize those requests and use the reporting that I'll show you in a second. Branding allows us to change the look and feel. So the landing page, this was the page right at the beginning which Ben started from here. Um, to edit this content, uh, we just click on the uh, landing page and I just can type in here to change it. So uh, whatever I like really, this is new text. Space there, And you see I've got formatting options. So if I highlight that, I can make that bold. Um, I can add in hyperlinks, I can add in pictures, as I said, we can underline text, we can align it, we can add in video, whatever you need. Um, but once I'm happy with that um, change, I said you can change all these as well, in summaries, whatever you need to change. But once you're happy with that, just hit save. And if I flip back to Ben's view, you can see that once it's refreshed, you can see that change in there. We can also change the request page, which is the second page you get to that shows the list of forms. Uh, we can change the app branding, which is something you probably want to do straight away. So at the moment we've got the trust name, this is displayed in um, the request handler in the admin view, but also up here in the public view. So let's just change that to um, no, edited. Um, we can change trust description, that's changed in some other places as well. Um, a hyperlink. We could change um, and we can up change the logo. So let's add a new logo in so it doesn't show this your logo here. I've got a sample NHS logo um, on my desktop here. So if I save, see if I refresh this, it changes it here for us and it should change up here for our view as well. Uh, the response templates, um, I don't think there's any here at the moment, no, but if we added some response templates in here, these are the templates you can choose from when responding to a request. You'll see you can add in the different content. You can also choose what response type it's associated with. So when you choose your response type when sending response, it filters out the, uh, the different templates available for you. Um, forms, this is obviously quite a key part of the application. As I said before, we set you up with three forms. Um, you don't have to use these. If you don't like the questions on them, you can, um, you can delete them and start again, or you can just edit them. But let me go ahead and edit the form that we use today, the application for your own health records. And you see some of the options on a form. I'll come back to versions. We've got options. We can hide the form. So if you don't want to make it visible, um, we can hide it. Uh, if we want to enable it for manual entry, so a request handlers can use this form when they're manually uploading a form, which is to enable it there. And we can either turn on or turn off the identity check um, for the form. The reference, this allows us to customize the reference number that's given out um, every time someone submits this form. We can prefix the reference number with static text, and we can also add some text at the end with some static text. But we can also change the um, middle part of the reference number. So we can either use an ID, which is explained here as a sequential number that just increments. Um, it's padded out to a certain length just so we can make sure it's unique. But we can also, on your request, start this number whatever you like. So it doesn't have to start at one. You can ask our support guys to set this uh, you know, to maybe 2010 or something. So it, it, it looks, uh, looks okay for the first request. Um, we've also got GUID, which would be this 32 uh, bit number, which is um, pretty long, but very unique. Uh, or we can have a random text, which is a random number. Um, and again, we can specify the length of that number. So you've got a few different options about how you want to build that reference number. But if I flip back to versions, you'll see that each form has, uh, can have uh, a bunch of versions. There will only be one version that's live. If it's live, that means that that's the version that, as long as it's not hidden, that people will see when they um, are filling in their requests or choosing a request type. 
The reason we have different versions is what you can do is you can copy your existing version and then you can freely edit that other version, your copied version, without impacting that live form. So if I, when I mean, you're happy with it, you could just make this the live version. But if I edit this um, version, the version two, um, you can see under controls, this is our form builder. So we have the different sections along the top, which you can just scroll through. Um, you can move controls up and down. Um, you can add in new rows. You can add in new questions, whether it's a text box, a text area, whether you want to be a file upload, radio buttons, checkbox, those kind of things. You can add in just information. So I'll just add in some text in here. Make it, uh, make it bold, center align it. You choose whether or not the, the question is on the manual upload. So this is how administrator can make that manual upload uh, a lot quicker for some, a request handler to fill in than somebody who's filling it in from the public. And you see, you just add it in there. So pretty easy to design the forms. If you're not comfortable with designing the forms, then uh, it's just a call to our support team. We're quite happy to design these forms for you, either with you, um, or you can give us a template for us to work on, however, however best suits you. Um, when you're designing the form, you can preview it, obviously. So if you click preview, you can have a go at sending the form without actually making a request. And this just makes sure that everything looks the way you want it to, all the validations working how you want it to. The thank you page is that confirmation page that shows once somebody's made the request. So I said earlier on that you can customize it. This is where you would do it. So um, you can change the formatting of it. So maybe we want to make the reference number bold. Um, I said we can pull in dynamic values of the form. So if I wanted to put in the person's name who completed the form, I could put hi, um, first name, whatever it might be, and that would then put that person's name who completed the form in. We can also configure an external email. So this was the email notification that was sent to Ben when he first submitted the form. This is where we would edit that content or edit the subject. And we can um, set up an internal email as well. So this is slightly different to the email notification that a request handler would get when a request is assigned to them. This is an email notification that would be sent to whoever we put in here when this form is completed to let them know that a new form is in the request pool for, for someone to action. Um, we can manage our users, obviously. We can manage both the internal users, which are our request handlers and our admins. And we can um, manage our external users. These are people that have got access to the portal um, area to make requests. We can obviously disable accounts, delete accounts. Um, we can reassign requests. Um, there's lots of things we can do within there. And lastly, I just want to show you the reports. This is quite a neat piece of functionality. Um, it allows you to report on different statuses of a request. So we can see which requests are completed, what are outstanding. Requests that are breaching, requests that are compliant or rejected. I'll just leave it on all for the time being. Uh, I'll change my data set so I've got a little bit more information. We'll go back to April. And you can filter on a request handle as well, but we'll just keep it on all users at the moment. I'll click search. And you'll see uh, we produce a graph, but we've also, probably most importantly, got all of that data. It's paged, but again, if you need to um, export this information, all you need to do is Choose the last option that shows here in your page. It will give you a list of all the info. And again, you can um, choose which columns you want to include or um, remove. And then you can just download that in a certain format. So let's do a spreadsheet. Um, oops, sorry. And we'll open that up. And you can see that gives me all of my data. So all the requests between April and uh, the end of this month. We do have reports here as well, so graphical reports. Um, so this is showing us this data based on the request category. Um, we could change it into a form that's been completed. Um, we could change it via state status. We've also got trends, so we could see uh, how forms are changing over time period. So this is uh, by form, we can see that there's been a lot of applications on behalf of others um, over the last couple of months compared to application for own records is really low. Um, and this would obviously pull in all the um, forms that you've created. 
um, we've got other ones there from status or owner, so who's completed what um, request. You can see that um, Damien had a bit of a peak last month, but um, I'm slowly catching up with everybody else. Um, and you can save these images off as well. So if these are useful to you, um, you can download these and attach them to your spreadsheet or whatever reports that you guys want to run from this, um, this download. Uh, it's entirely up to you. So hopefully this reporting error will help you um, with your reports. Um, and I think that's pretty much all I wanted to show. I did forget to show you something which always comes up when we demo this. So I'm just going to flick, quickly show you it. It's just reassigning requests. So an admin can do it in a user. So if if there was a person um, that was perhaps going on holiday, they had a bunch of requests, an admin can come in here and reassign all the requests to another request handle or back to the pool. But as a user as well, I can reassign my request. So I can do it either individually. So I could reassign this request to maybe Damien. Um, or I can, if I need to do a bunch of requests, I can just uh, toggle on this edit mode choose the requests I want, and then just reassign them all out back to either the pool or to somebody else, such as Damien. But um, yeah, I think that probably uh, finishes my demo. Um, if you guys have got any questions, obviously use that question box, and we'll get to them at the end. But for the moment, I'm going to hand you back to Damien. Great stuff. Thank you, Rich. Um, let me just swap back. Can you still hear me okay, Rich? Yep, I can hear you fine. Great stuff, and you can see my screen okay? Yep. Brilliant stuff. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys have found this useful. Uh, I know the role that we focused on today is managing the subject access requests, but the platform can be used for any type of request process, such as free of information requests or requests from staff for their own personal information. And having attended this webinar, you guys are all entitled to a free trial account. So to activate this, um, you just need to send an email to nhstrial at ams-ltd.com or um, you know, please feel free to, to give us a call. If you want to discuss the solution further, then we're also happy to arrange a conference call or personalized web demo. Um, and to arrange this, just contact your account manager or email hello at ams-ltd.com. And that's the end of the presentation, but what I was gonna do next, if that's okay, is to go through some of your questions. So I'm just gonna open those up. So I've got a question here from Phil. Can the categorization handle a situation where you use the available discretion to extend the time limit some requests have a one month time limit, some have three months. So I guess that's kind of the request category type thing, Rich. Yeah, and um, that's really one of the main reasons that we allow you to create different request categories. It's not just for the reporting or to identify maybe the source of the request. It is to handle those different thresholds. So when you add a request in, you'll be able to set the number of days that request should be responded uh, to before it breaches, uh, but also set the number of days that you want it to change um, through the different flagging system, that traffic light system. So you can say how many days it should be in there before it turns red, how many days it should be in there before it turns amber from green. So it just helps the request handlers prioritize the request, um, even if uh, the different requests have different um, breach settings. Thanks, Rich. Um, next question was, can, um, can we delete the uploaded documents once the identity is verified? Yep, sorry if I, if I didn't show that, but um, you can just, where I view the document is, there's a context menu, you just click on it, and it's the view, I think there's view, edit, download, um, but there's also a delete option there as well. So if you hit delete, it will just remove it from the queue, remove it from that list, sorry. Okay. Um, now, I know we went through some of the reporting options, um, but I've got a couple of questions around the functionality of the reports. Um, and I've got a question here saying, uh, what kinds of reporting functionality does the product have? 
Um, I hope we've we've shown a few of those. Um, Rich, I don't know if you were able to kind of run through some of the examples um, just to confirm that. Um, you mean demo it? I'd, you'd have to switch it back to my screen if you want to show you. Um, that's fine. But, but but I think I think we showed that you can run a report on the statuses um, of the requests, so whether they've been completed or breached. Um, you can run, uh, you can kind of split that down based on the request handler. Um, we've also got requests based on the form type category, um, and we've also got the trends. But if that's something that you're interested in looking at in a bit more detail, we'd be happy to uh, arrange like a, a personal session for that. Um, got another question around, could this be used for FOIs? Uh, I did mention this at the end, but it is um, a neat, platform to handle pretty much any request based process whether that's a freedom of information request and um, quite often trusts are getting requests from staff or, or piece of information um, and because you can make this public facing you can receive requests from anybody you like um, I've got a question here about how is it licensed um, and I think I, I can handle that so with the um, with the file transfer platform, that was based on users, but with the subject access request management platform, it's based on transactions. So we have different packages available depending on how many requests you're handling per month. And if you had any questions around pricing, um, please drop us an email and uh, with some details around how many requests you're handling, and we can kind of get you some indicative costs over to you. I've got a, a question here. Um, does the application allow requests to be monitored after submission, for example, to keep track of cases where the request is not satisfied and to say decides to make a complaint either internally or externally via a regulator? Now, I, I think, Rich, um, it kind of maintains the history and audit trail of every request so you can see exactly what user has done you know, has performed what action at what time. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to add to that, Rich. Only that, you know, it's up, it's up to you as a trust to say how long you want to keep the request for. Um, there's no additional charge or anything to keep the request. Um, you just need to let us know or configure it within the system in the admin area of how long you want to keep those requests for. There is also an option to download a request. So that will download the request as a zip file. Um, it will include all the audit data, all of the files, um, and everything that goes along with that request. So if you want to kind of get the request out of the portal, that's possible too as well. And um, yeah, I think I think that's it, Damien. Nice. Brilliant. Thanks. Now I'll, we've we've got a ton of questions here, but I'm conscious we've overrun a little bit. So uh, there was one question here that I thought was useful to answer. Um, is this a cloud-based system? So I think Rich mentioned it, but yes, this is a cloud-based system based in Azure. Um, our platforms are hosted based on requirements from the NHS. Um, and we have, as, as I mentioned earlier, over 25 NHS trusts using the file transfer platform. Um, and we've gone through various kind of information security scrutinization processes in order to make sure that that information is secure. Um, apologies if we haven't got to your question, I promise you, we will um, email you directly to make sure you have the information you need. But again, if there's anything you think of, please drop us an email. Um, so we come to the end of the session. Thank you for everybody's time. If you um, wouldn't mind, we have a survey that will pop up at the end. If you could please take a minute to fill this out, that would be really appreciated. But um, thank you to everyone for your time today and hopefully we'll speak to you soon.